Hey, Corey. Hey, Greg. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Good, good to be talking to you, to, to you today. Yeah, you too. Uh, to introduce ourselves for, for the benefit of viewers, uh, my name is Greg Marks. I am a an editor, <coughs> excuse me, an editor at the uh, Columbia Journalism Review, and I help to run our United States project, which um, which essentially reviews, monitors, critiques uh, accountability journalism uh, at news organizations around the country. Yeah, and I'm Corey Hutchins. I'm a correspondent for Columbia Journalism Review's United States project. Uh, based in Colorado. And the uh, the last time, Greg, you and I did one of these blogging heads, we were talking about election coverage in uh, North Carolina, where I used to be based, and uh, it was a big swing state there. And now I feel like I've moved into a, an even uh, swingier state uh, for this election. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, so we're going to talk for a little bit today about, uh, about both the uh, election results last week in Colorado and, uh, and the coverage of the campaign that preceded it. Um, so why don't, why don't you run through a little bit about sort of, sort of the, um, sort of the, the main results of the election, which, which was one of the more sort of closely watched contests around the country. Yeah. So Colorado was, is the, the new, uh, bellwether for America, everybody, this election, these, these midterms were looking to Colorado to see, um, as a gauge to how the, how the country's going to go in, in 2016 and the big, uh, there are two huge uh, elections in the state where for U.S. Senate, it was a uh, Republican Cory Gardner is a dynamic young congressman from the Eastern Plains, uh, challenged um, incumbent Senator, Democratic Senator Mark Udall. Uh, and uh, that was probably, I think it was this, the, the second, the, the election where the second most amount of money was spent in the country this year. And then there was the gubernatorial race between John Hickenlooper, who's the incumbent Democrat here who for a long time was just widely viewed as a complete bulletproof lock for uh, poor choice of words. And I'll get to that later. Bulletproof, bulletproof lock for the, uh, for reelection, but ended up getting in some, um, some trouble. And his opponent was a, uh, a very far right uh, Republican named um, Bob Beaupre, former Congressman who had run in 2006 and lost. And uh, the, Republicans in the on the Senate race, uh, Cory Gardner uh, beat uh, Mark Udall. It was very close. Everyone was it was a real nail nail biter. Everyone was wondering what was going to happen. Um, and yet, uh, as the Republicans took over a lot of the elections uh, throughout the country, uh, we've seen it described as a, a Republican sweep. Um, the Mark uh, John Hickenlooper, the Democrat uh, running for governor, was able to hold on and actually beat uh, uh, Beaupre by a larger margin than. Um, Cory Gardner B. Mark Udall. So the question now is like, what is Colorado? Is it a, a red state now? I don't think so. Is it um, a blue state or is it a solidly purple state? And I think that is uh, what a lot of the post-election coverage is going to be about. And also the legislature, surprisingly, went um, is split now. The the Colorado Senate is now controlled by the Republicans. The House is uh, held on, and, and that was uh, for Democrats. And that was... Um, I think surprising to a lot of people because it really wasn't covered as much as the big ticket races were. Uh, and so this is kind of um, what now that the media in Colorado are kind of focusing on. Right. Right. What, one note. So, I mean, there was an expectation that, that the Senate race would be closed. It, it, yeah. it ultimately was. I mean, it, it wasn't a blowout, but it, but it wasn't like a nail biter outcome. Right. I mean, uh, Gar Gardner did win pretty comfortably in mm -hmm. the end. And um, and Hickenlooper, you know, there's been a lot of debate about the polling. I mean, so on the Republicans in the Senate race, the Republican, the, the polling did kind of understate Gardner's support a, a bit, um, I, I think. And um, but on, in the governor's race, Hickenlooper ran, you know, I think ahead of a number of the polls. And, and like you said, um, opened up, a, ended up with a wider uh, margin than it looked like he was going to have um, earlier on election night. Um so th there were a couple like um, – so right. So there is this – so one of the things – one of the sort of threads of discussion throughout the campaign was essentially could the ground game save the Democrats in Colorado, right? And there were, there were a lot of analogies drawn to, uh, drawn to 2010 when Michael Bennett um, won in a Republican year uh, by defeating a more a – more, a, a Republican who ran on a sort of more conservative campaign that year. Um, and much of that was attributed to like, you know, essentially the, the secret sauce of the democratic ground game. 
Um, and so how, how did you see that, you know, ultimately playing out uh, on Election Day and, and through the late stages of the campaign? Uh, this year? Well, the the biggest change was that Colorado had last year changed its uh, election laws. While we've seen um, restricting restrictive voting measures in legislatures throughout the country, uh, like voter ID or ending early voting, Colorado did the complete opposite. Uh, this year was the first big election where everybody who's a registered voter got their ballot in the mail. I just moved here in August. I registered to vote. And um, my ballot came and it sat on my kitchen table for, uh, I think, a couple of weeks before I ended up sending it in a day before Election Day. But you could uh, send it in the day you get it. You can also, you can also register um, and vote on the same day, on Election Day here in Colorado. So it really expanded, it should expand the electorate. A lot of people um, were getting phone calls and direct mail, people knocking on their doors uh, up until election, up until they turned in their ballot, and that was one of the interesting things. The campaigns were able to uh, dial down and find out exactly what household ballot was still sitting on their kitchen table or wherever and hadn't been sent in. And until you send it in, they were just going to keep uh, harassing you. Hey, vote for my candidate. And um, the Democrats really the whole time uh, were just kind of bragging, saying like, "Well, we, this is this is our like you said, secret sauce. This is what's gonna this is what's gonna save us if it is a." A Republican year. And in the end, the Republicans actually did a better job with that. And that's kind of one of the biggest, um, biggest surprises in the election, because the Republican, the Democrats were more than happy to talk to any reporter who would listen uh, and tell them how their how great their ground game was. The Republicans in a, a piece, I think it was in US News and World Report, um, Cory Gardner even said it's like the first rule of Fight Club, you don't talk about it. Uh, the Republicans didn't want to talk about what they were doing. And it was really funny at the, in the last days of the campaign, um, Mark Udall, I saw him at a campaign stop in Colorado Springs, and he was boasting that Americans for, for Prosperity had said that they knocked on something like 145,000 doors since June. And he was saying, we did, you know, our people did that this week. Um, and so put on a really brave face for the Democrats, but in the end, uh, the Republicans were able to use it to their advantage. And, and now I think we're seeing in the past couple of days, I've been seeing uh, in-state newspaper reports uh, pointing out uh, how they did it. Um, I would have liked to have seen that kind of reporting done before the election. But uh, there was, I think, the, the headline that Lynn Bartles used at the, uh, the Denver Post was uh, called it The Blind Side. Gotcha. Gotcha. And um is is the theory in part that the that the Republican you know the Republican ground operation just ha has caught up so much? Is it that this particular reform may you know well it may increase um, sort of uh, increase sort of participation throughout the electorate? You you may actually help um, you know it may boost sort of older voters um, disproportionately because you know using the mail is something that that. <laughs> They do yeah. more, is it? Yeah. yeah, I mean, also, it's the, the structure of the midterm, right? It's more uh, <laughs> right. it's, it's more beneficial to a, a, con a conservative electorate. But uh, I did see a piece in Politico magazine by Eli Stokels, who's a great reporter here for KDVR in Denver. He's a TV reporter who also does a lot of cross-platform uh, reporting and uh, his magazine pieces. And he wrote this for Politico magazine, and there was an anecdote in there from Pundit who said, um, you know, you think about it, uh, who... Who are the kind of people who just have boxes of stamps lying around? Older people. Yeah, did, <laughs> so they're going to send in their ballot. Did you Older actually need to put a stamp on your ballot? Or, or was it was it postage paid? I'm actually curious about I, this. I, I think I remember seeing you were supposed to put two stamps on it just to make sure. Um, really? I actually drove mine down to the polling place and just put it in the box that day. But yeah, I think I remember hearing that you were supposed to put two stamps on it just to make sure. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, you know, you you mentioned that. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll set this up. So, you mentioned how how you'd like to you you would have liked to have seen some reporting on on um, on on the sort of the campaign dynamics a little bit uh, during the course of the campaign, not after the fact. Um, you wrote a couple things for us, all right, about. Um, that were somewhat critical of of the coverage you saw, you sort of encountered after getting out after uh, getting out there, and um, I know you were at uh, you're in Denver right now, right? You yeah. live in Colorado Springs, but you're in Denver right now, mm -hmm. and you were actually at this morning at a discussion um, 
among some media types, and I'm not sure if I, I actually don't, I'm not sure if it's on the, if it was on the record or not. Or I don't want to put you in a tough spot. But, I, no, um, no, it doesn't. I'll tell you what. Yeah, so this was a really cool event put on by Jason Salzman, uh, who's the f- a former media critic for the uh, the defunct Rocky Mountain News. He now runs a blog called BigMedia.org. Um, and he writes for the Huffington Post sometimes. And uh, there was a Republican uh, consultant there as well. And they hosted this event with uh, four or five of uh, some of the, the reporters, uh, the political reporters in Colorado from TV uh, and print. Nick Riccardi from the AP was there. Uh, Peter Marcus from the um, Durango Herald. Eli Stokels from KDVR. Sean Boyd from a news channel in Denver. Uh, and Chuck Plunkett, who's the political editor for the Denver Post. So like a pretty dynamic group of reporters. And they're in this room and they were asked questions by the two moderators and also took audience questions basically like um, – it was basically a way for the reporters to kind of come up there and just like defend themselves from the public, whether they did a good job or a bad job and take questions. And uh, – what um, – so yeah, back to what you said about the, the two pieces that I wrote for CJR, one about the U.S. Senate race, one about the uh, Colorado race is, is I, I was a little disappointed in, in, the, in the campaign coverage. I think we called the coverage of the governor's race bloodless and kind of uh, the critique was that in, in both the U.S. Senate race and the governor's race is that the campaigns were just totally dominating the narrative and I didn't see a lot of really good enterprise reporting. I mean I saw a lot of – um, coverage that just tracked along what the campaigns were saying. Oh, this new TV ad came out. Oh, this new TV ad came out attacking that new TV ad. This press release came out from this candidate or this campaign. Uh, and then they, here's the response. And not much in the way of really letting voters know what was at stake in either elections, uh, specifically what would happen if the Republicans took control of the Senate, what that would mean for the country and Colorado. That was missing. And in the governor's race, a huge hole was um, up until the very end of the campaigns, what it would mean for Colorado, how Colorado would look under a new administration, under a Republican Bob Beaupre administration. And the questions that never really came up were whether the House or the Senate would flip to Republicans and what that would mean. Um, The legislative races were largely ignored and the reporters on that panel today totally admitted that and said that they kind of felt bad. They wish they had uh, the time and the resources to devote more of it to these legislative campaigns because they were these, the legislative races were very close. The Senate flipped. Um, So back to the critique in the governor's race, the one question I asked today on the panel was, uh, whether the new election laws would um, kind of uh, force the media to 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 kind of uh, redirect their timing and how they do stories, because you know you usually see the profiles of the candidates come out like a couple weeks before election day. Well, what if people have already got their ballots and they're thinking of mailing them in and they don't know who they're going to vote for? Uh, uh, one of the best pieces of journalism I saw on the gubernatorial race came from the Denver Post from a brand new reporter who just came here from North Carolina named John Frank, who wrote the story saying like, here's what um, the candidates say they're going to do and realistically what they would be able to do. And he kind of showed uh, voters and readers what uh, Hickenlooper's second term would look like and what a Bob Beaupre administration would look like. And that story came on October 25th when thousands of ballots had already been turned in and there's no way some, you know, someone's going to take back their ballots. Oh, I read this story, so I'm going to go change it. Um, so that was a very interesting dynamic here in Colorado this year. And uh, one I think that that some of the, the critiques that, that we leveled in CJR were kind of, I felt justified at least by uh, the admission by you know some of the reporters today who said, uh, I think Nick Riccardi from the AP said that this, this midterm election in Colorado just reminded him once again how the candidates totally control the narrative and the media cannot seem to break out of that. Any, uh, did they offer any, any hope? Any, um, I mean, it's, it's right. It's, I mean, there's a certain sort of like, You know, there's a certain, like it, it's 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 easy to you know from the outside, right? You know, and you know it, it can be easy to critique or you know easy to point out what's missing. You know, it, it's hard it, like it, when you're in there and when you're when you're doing this sort of work, and you can even sort of like be mindful 
of of the limitations uh, of the of of the coverage, but it can be. Um, I mean, you know, it's sort of telling, right, to like have reporters after the fact acknowledge this, um, but with every cycle. I mean, I think there are some ways in which coverage has sort of like gotten sharper and more aggressive, like mm -hmm. um, ac across the country. I mean, I, I think the fact checking movement um, has had has had pros and cons, but you know, it has, um, I think, I think influenced um, sort of, sort of mainstream coverage a bit. Um, but at the same time, there, there's a, you know, I was emailing with some t someone else about this and recently, and I, I feel like there is. There's a lot of hand wringing about around the, like the state of local journalism, right? And so, and often for good reason. But it's not like there's no enterprise coverage, you know, happening from legacy outlets, from new outlets. Um, and it's not like there's no enterprise um, coverage of government. Like you know, mm -hmm. you and I and our other correspondents like see it every you know every week. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like th these campaigns do not show. Local coverage, in particular, you know, in in the in the strongest light. Like th this is not where, even though you know we see like we'll see creative, enterprising coverage of government in other areas, um, more so than in the than in the campaigns. Yeah, I agree. I just read a great enterprise piece, and I. Th in a, in a local newspaper here in Colorado that analyzed um, judicial uh, retention, the candidates who were for judges who were uh, being retained and went through and found out that um, female judges have a harder time uh, getting through the screening process than, than male justice. And I think that is like, that's the definition of enterprise reporting. You know, it's data journalism and it, it, it shows a, a unique problem and um that kind of thing I, I just didn't see that kind of coverage in in the campaigns what i did see is like i said before it's a lot of what we call reactive coverage you here's what campaign x says about campaign y or here's what uh, so and so said on the stump but actually i actually didn't see very much um real uh campaign trail uh coverage here in colorado this year either uh, so that's, I, I think, uh, another problem. Uh, but certainly, yeah, you, yeah that, you mentioned that, you know, other news organizations might be, you know, filling the void also for the mainstream uh, press. We highlighted a story at CJR by the nonprofit, the online digital only nonprofit called the Colorado Independent here. And they were the only one who really looked at who this Bob Beaupre candidate was and some of the very... I'll say it, extreme things that he said over the past several years that he's been out of politics. And the mainstream papers really did not uh, get into that too much. And that was a critique leveled at some of these reporters today by somebody in the audience. And someone, uh, uh, a guy uh, right. on the left uh, said, you know, how come the Denver Post gave, essentially gave the Republican a pass on these crazy things he said? And Chuck Plunkett, the uh, political editor, uh, essentially told him that they covered it a little bit, but um, there's, you know, maybe he said it too long ago for it to matter and something like that. So, uh, you know, there was a, a difference between how the MSM ha handled that candidate and how other outlets did. Yeah. Like w what you said about, about the sort of lack of campaign trail reporting is also striking, right? Because, I mean, Colorado is kind of a far flung spread out state, but most, most of the population centers are all within a cup, you know, some places are on the other side of the Rockies, but, mm -hmm. but most of the population is on the east side of the Rockies. Um, the the media outlets are, are concentrated there. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that's oh, yeah, all the populations, on yeah, the, all the populations on the front range, pretty much, yeah. Right. So, and then, but you know, so it's not, it's not like it. It wouldn't seem, you know, I, I could be, I could be wrong, but it wouldn't seem like a huge under, you know undertaking to, to sort of spend more time on the campaign trail. But, the but you know, I don't think we saw that much of that, right? Like the, the sort of like, um, and it, look, it's more magazine-y type reporting than newspaper reporting mm -hmm. um, than, than sort of daily drumbeat stuff. But still, you know, we saw this, um, you know, you wrote about the piece by Andrew Romano. Was it, was it in Yahoo News? In Yahoo or, yeah. And, you know, where he spent some time with the candidates on the trail and, and a certain sort of like, um, sort of contextual, um, sort of big picture, um, sort of sense and sensibility comes out of that that you don't get off the um, 
off the sort of like micro pieces, you know, even though, you know, he wasn't, you know, I don't know that it was like deeply, you know, sort of challenging or like, you know, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't hostile Mm -hmm. to, to any of the candidates or anything like that, but it's just sort of a different vibe and sense that you get from, in that case, you know, from an outside correspondent who just had the luxury of spending time on the trail. Um, yeah, that's right. right. Which that's right. I mean, he Andrew Romano came in from I think California, and he uh, logged seven hundred miles on his car and followed those guys around for like a week. And I don't know if uh, mainstream newspaper is going to allow their reporter to go do that. I think they should. <laughs> you know, I'd like to see that kind of reporting. His his piece was one of my my favorites of the of the cycle. But um, you know, one of the one of the craziest. Uh, the campaign trail moments uh, of the U S Senate race came in the final days and it was, uh, broken by a national outlet. Um, I can't think of exactly what outlet it was right now, but, uh, it was just like a normal campaign stop where Mark Udall was talking about, um, some of the, the, the main issue in his campaign was uh, women's reproductive rights. And someone in the audience just started swearing and saying like that's all you talk about and um i was laughing about it with a a reporter uh today saying like you know there's a good you know that that guy that out-of-town reporter got a good piece about that because it turns out the guy who was heckling udall was a big time millionaire democratic donor uh who was frustrated (laughs) with the way uh his preferred candidate was running his campaign on a single issue and um right and uh i said you know that were there no Colorado reporters there and this reporter told me actually I was there but I couldn't interview the guy because I literally had to jump on the bus uh with that candidate and go to the next stop um because his car was somewhere else so there's you know pitfalls with being you know the embed following around the campaign too but there are those gems that you you do pick up along the trail I pointed out in one of the pieces I wrote uh, for CJR how I I, uh, happened to stumble into a rally um that Udall and Hickenlooper were holding outside of a debate. I didn't see, I think I saw one other reporter show up to it. And one of the first things Udall says was, let's raise the minimum wage. Um, that was an issue that was just, it seemed to me, just totally missing from the coverage. I mean, it was a huge Democratic issue this year. The president wants to raise the minimum wage. A lot of Democratic candidates do. This Democratic candidate did. He wasn't mentioning it so much. I didn't, don't think he mentioned it in the debate that night. It certainly did not make its way in any of the post-debate coverage. Um, what did make it in were, you know, his attacks on uh, personhood, and, uh, other issues that were, you know, tightly framed by this by this candidate and reflected in the coverage. Right, and we should say right. So the the idea that that the campaigns, you know, sort sort of like control the narrative. There was um, you, you mentioned like the the Democratic donor who was upset at Udall's sort of campaign. I mean, the the Colorado press was like very. I think frustrated with uh, with Udall's, you know, quote unquote, you know, is referred to as the, as the war on women, you know, sort of, sort of campaign, right? And I mean, he was, you know, in a sense, you know, mocked um, by some local reporters for it by the Denver um, Post editorial board. The center left Denver right. Post editorial board made huge national news when they endorsed Cory Gardner, basically slapping down Mark Udall, saying he ran an obnoxious single issue campaign. Right, um, and uh, I think wasn't he referred to? Wasn't he publicly referred to as Mark Uterus? Oh, um, yeah. by one of Lynn, 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 this is just going to be a like legendary footnote in Colorado media history. Lynn Barles of the right. Denver Post, um, quoting uh, somebody else, uh, called him Mark Uterus during a debate and asked him to right. basically defend himself on that, and um, it became a meme, and he could not, he couldn't, couldn't get past that and he kept it up yeah, too I mean, he kept, so he, he kept, the, the campaign kept it up too i mean that was right they, that was the they were very disciplined play. about this in the yeah. in the face of criticism they, mm-hmm. they were very disciplined that this was the campaign that they wanted to run mm-hmm. well i mean one of one of the sort of striking and you know again it's it's always easier to sort of you know find a find a way to critique from the outside but one of the striking things to me was in the face of like you know local media like clearly not being very happy or being very impressed or, or forget being impressed, feeling like what Udall was trying to make the campaign about was, was sort of limiting, um, 
you know, didn't think that this is what the campaign should or should all be about. What you got was that, you know, journalists did not think that Udall was focusing on the right thing. What you didn't get was, you know, okay, let's, you know, one way or another try to sort of put other issues on the agenda here. That's right. Uh, uh, this came up during the media panel this morning here in Denver. Uh, and I think that the, there, were, there were five reporters there and they were kind of split on whether it's possible to knock a candidate off script or not. There are some reporters who are saying, like, you just can't do it. You can't get through these incredibly disciplined candidates. Uh, Corey Gardner famously told Eli Stokels in a one-on-one -on -one interview, which is a great interview, about the personhood. I'll give you a quick background on the personhood thing. There was a state initiative on the ballot here, um, the personhood uh, ballot measure, and there's a federal uh, personhood piece of legislation. Corey Gardner's on the federal one. He says he's not for the state one. Obvious question is, what's the difference? He would not say, and he just told the reporter. Well, he would. Say, he you're right. That there he was no person. He said there was no federal personhood bill, and he said it six right. times. And every reporter from out of state who flew in here asked him the same question, and he would just give the same answer. He finally changed his answer later to, "It's just a statement that I support life." But you know, the, the question on the panel was like, "What do you do when?" You, as a reporter, believe the guy's lying to your face and you just can't say it to him on camera. Like, how do you get that across? And uh, one of the reporters said, look, it was widely reported and the voters just didn't care. What did it matter? Um, and so, like, yeah, there's a big question of, like, whether – there's a question about whether debates matter. Because some of these debates I saw just turned into total talking point fests. They've got – 20 seconds to answer a question and they know exactly what they're going to say and unless you're in a uh, an, an odd kind of format debate which there was one in, in Pueblo Colorado where the audience really kind of got involved and were like kind of like heckling and, and getting and getting rowdy and it kind of knocked the candidates around a little bit and they started going off script like that's the kind of thing that can um, get them to talk about different things but other than that I mean you're just looking at uh interviewing a candidate who's very disciplined on their talking points. And Corey Gardner was, he ran like an amazing campaign because he was so incredibly disciplined with that. You couldn't shake the guy. Right. All right. All right. Corey, anything, anything else we should, we should hit here? Um, yeah, actually I think one interesting thing that I haven't seen uh, reported too, too much that I'd like to see more of um, is the, like the gun issue in Colorado. A lot of the, a lot of the reporting on why Hickenlooper was having – why he was in trouble this year had to do with um, – he was the Democratic governor who, who signed legislation that, that – you know, gun control legislation after some shootings here. And there were historic recall elections in Colorado where um, Republicans uh, took two seats – knocked two Democrats out of the legislature who supported uh, these gun control measures. Um, Hickenlooper – uh, no matter how much trouble he was in because of that, like he won re-election and the two Republicans who came in on that historic uh, recall election over um, gun rights lost to Democrats. So I think that's another like fascinating, uniquely Colorado situation where people are going to have to, it has national implications. Okay. Where is the country on, on this stuff? When it's a very small recall election, the gun rights voters come out and, you know, will show retribution because of it. But in a broader electorate, the Democrats come back. So I think that's something that maybe we'll see kind of fleshed out in 2016. Right. And and briefly, I mean, I think watching Colorado state politics going forward is going to be is going to be very interesting. I mean, you, you talked about the the, the mail-in ballot reform. It's one of the things that was done by the Democratic legislature, right? Mm -hmm. Um that uh that that you know, when, when Democrats fully control the legislature, and I think probably one of the reasons that Hicken, one of the reasons that Hook and Looper looked vulnerable for a time is, you know, he had kind of had this sort of like non-partisan-y, post-partisan-y um, sort of persona, um, somewhat separately from from the Democratic Party. Um, but the Democratic Party had been very successful in Colorado. Um, you know, sort of consolidated uh, control of the legislature um, during Hick and Looper's um, governorship. Push policy to to the left um, as a as a result of that, um, and um, so you got the the gun control measures and, and other measures um, that that sort of um, sparked uh, sparked sparked the the blowback like we saw with, with those recall elections. Um, 
Meanwhile, Hickenlooper has always been, you know, I think, right, like a little bit, you know, he's not positioned as sort of like a leader of that of that leftward shift necessarily. Um, and, you know, there was the like, fracking is obviously a big issue in the state. And um, we've been critical of some of the coverage, you know, Lynn Bartels at The Post. I know, um, you know, you had flagged like a, a, an excellent piece that she wrote in August, maybe, yeah, was, about yeah. Hickenlooper's. Big Hickenlooper's um, essentially, that. yeah, like his his ability to sort of like cobble together this big compromise to you know and effectively you know attempt to defuse um, the issue politically, mm-hmm. um, and it'll be interesting to see um, both both how how the fracking issue proceeds, but how how other issues proceed in the state. Um, you know, now, now that you have a split legislature um, and and this you know democratic but not particularly partisan governor. Um, and you know, is this a, is there, do you have gridlock the way, you know, we have at the, uh, at, you know, at the federal level, um, is there sort of like, um, compromise or conciliation? And if there is, you know, what is the direction of, of, uh, of policy? Um, you know, what, what does that compromise look like? I'm, I'm interested to see it going forward. Well, the. The, the great thing about that is, is that you've got a correspondent based in Colorado for the United States Project. So, <laughs> so check at uh, cool. check CJR.org and uh, the Politics and Policy Desk of the United States Project, and we'll have, uh, we'll have more about all that coverage in the future. All right, cool. Good talking to you, Corey. Hey, you too. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.